so in this video let's talk about different causes of vertigo so all these are the uh, you know differential diagnosis when you when a, you see a patient come in with the vert vertigo benign paroxysmal position vertigo this is the main one Meniere's disease and acoustic neuroma are the main ones vestibular neuritis and labyrinthitis are very easy to understand and easy to remember so firstly about benign posi benign paroxysmal positional vertigo so benign means this is not a dangerous condition okay it is a simple condition which is easily treatable paroxysmal is it comes it comes in suddenly okay it presents suddenly and it goes away soon positional it uh, it precipitate it is precipitated with any change in your head positions and vertigo is the main symptom along with vertigo the patient might also have nystagmus plus nausea or sometimes vomiting all right so the common cause the most common cause is otoliths so as you can see in this image here all these small dots these are the otoliths otoliths are nothing but oto is ear and lids is nothing but stones right so these stones whenever you are whenever the patient is moving his head these stones are going up and down in the semicircular canals so the main structure that is affected is the posterior semicircular canal so when uh, when there is some disturbance here th that is obviously the inner ear so this inner ear disturbance will cause vertigo that is the main symptom so uh, the patient will complain of vertigo with uh, uh, and he'll say whenever he's like you know uh, getting up from his bed or whenever he's going to bed or whenever he is doing some kind of head movements the uh, he is getting this vertigo and which lasts for 20 to 30 seconds it is very sudden and it lasts for a few seconds he might also have nausea so uh, diagnosis for this condition is dix hall pike maneuver so you can remember it as dix right so it has in the name itself it has dx dx is nothing but diagnosis so for diagnosis it is d uh, dix and uh, after d comes e right so for management it is at least maneuver so what dix holpike test is dix holpikes you will ask the patient to sit and turn his head 45 degrees and put him down uh, below the horizontal line and check for nystagmus so if this test is positive that means if the patient is having uh, nystagmus after this that means dix holpike is positive so if dix holpike is positive then you'll uh, perform the epley's at least maneuver which is the management for this condition so for epley's maneuver same side uh, same uh, head you just turn to the opposite side and put him in that position for 30 degrees and then ask the patient to look to, to to look towards the floor okay move him that side and ask him to look towards the floor again meet him for 30 seconds and then bring him up back into this upright position and again wait for 30 seconds so what happens with this is when you're you know moving the patient all those you know to uh, to many sides the the otoliths are going to be repositioned so they're going to be repositioned in such a way that they're not causing any uh, damage or any issue in the semicircular canal anymore therefore the vertigo will reduce so again dix dx for diagnosis so for diagnosis it is dix holpike and after d comes e therefore at least for man man uh, management so the next and a very easy topic is vestibular neuritis and labyrinthitis so these two are different topics one and two so let's it is a very easy, uh, uh, i mean they are very you know comparative topics so uh, both of them have itis right so itis is nothing but inflammation so this inflammation is occurring because of some infection all right so urti any upper respiratory tract infection is going to lead to vestibular neuritis or labyrinthitis so itis inflammation post infection all right so both of these uh, have uh, you know they don't precipitate with a change in head position but they get exacerbated so like we studied before bppv is precipitated by a change in the head position while this is exacerbated by a change in the head position it is not precipitated okay both of these conditions there is history of upper respiratory tract infection here because itis itis so as you can see here this is the vestibulo cochlear nerve and this is the vestibular part this part so here there is some small inflammation here this image here th this is the vestibular nerve right this is the vestibulo cochlear vestibular part of the vestibulo cochlear nerve and there is some so small inflammation here right so this is just a nerve inflammation all right which will get a which will get better with time so it is not going to you know have any major effects on the patient because the inner ear is not affected it's just the nerve which is getting a little inflamed which will get better soon but here if you see there is inflammation of the inner ear right 
So when there is inflammation of the inner ear, that is labyrinthitis, it means the inner ear. So this inflammation will eventually cause hearing loss in the patient because the inner ear is being affected, right? Along with hearing loss, the patient might have tinnitus because the, you know, the ear, the signals, the uh, auditory signals are not passing properly because of the inflammation in the inner ear. So here in vestibular neuritis, it is just the nerve inflammation, therefore ear is not affected. Whereas labyrinthitis is nothing but the inner ear inflammation, right? Because of the damage to the inner ear, there will be hearing loss and the patient might have tinnitus. And, from, and management for both the conditions is just any antihistamine, alright? This is an antihistamine oral. So this is just symptomatic management because it is just inflammation which will get better with time. Therefore, you just give him antihistamine to, you know, manage his symptoms, that is his vertigo. The next condition is Meniere's disease. So Meniere's disease is nothing but a lot of accumulation of uh, endolymph, okay? So this endolymph here is going to put pressure on the inner ear, on the vestibulocochlear. This is the inner ear on the semicircular canals, on the, you know, vestibulocochlear nerve. Therefore, the patient will have a triad. Okay, so this triad is going to be vertigo, 1, tinnitus, 2 and sensory neural hearing loss. This is going to be sensory neural because his nerve is being inflamed, nerve is getting damaged here. Because of this excessive fluid, the nerve is getting compressed. Therefore, the patient will have sensory neural, that is the nerve damage of the, I mean, sensory neural type of hearing loss. He will also have tinnitus because his inner ear is being damaged, is being pressurized here and vertigo. The patient might also have the feeling of ear fullness because of that all that excessive fluid all right so uh, for the investigations you uh, put the patient to an audiometry pure tone audiometry which will confirm that the patient has a sensory neural hearing loss and then you have to do a mri because you have to rule out vestibular vestibular neuroma so vestibular neuroma is also going to affect eighth cranial nerve right even here the vestibulocochlear nerve is being affected right even in Meniere's disease and even vestibular neuroma is going to affect the 8th cranial nerve along with other nerves such as 7th and 5th ones. But the main thing is it is also affecting 8th uh, cranial nerve. Therefore, always rule out a vestibular neuroma because it is a malignant condition. So, for management, you give the patient again antihistamines to, you know, uh, uh, to uh, manage his symptoms. That is his vertigo. Because this fluid will get back to its, you know, to whatever position it was in before back. Uh, okay, so you don't have to, you know, remove the fluid or anything. It will go away on its own. And for prophylaxis, you give the patient beta HD. So beta is nothing but the second letter, right? Beta. Therefore, this is the second line drug, which you use for prophylaxis. All right. The next one is acoustic neuroma. So acoustic is nothing but uh, ear. Okay. And neuroma is nothing but a mass, right? Um, You know, some tumor, right? So this mass here, as you can see, this is the cerebellopontine angle okay this is the cerebellum here right this is the cerebellum and this is the pons right the cerebellum is like this therefore this is coming exactly from the cerebellopontine angle therefore this mass is called the cerebellopontine mass okay it is the acoustic neuroma also called as schwannoma so we have discussed before about some cranial nerves right so let's get back to that once and you know just revise what well, I mean how these cranial nerves pass. So as you can see uh, we have 12 cranial nerves right. So the first 4 cranial nerves go uh, above the pons that is midbrain. The next 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 in the pons and 9, 10, 11, 12 in the medulla oblongata. So just know that the first and the second cranial nerves do not have nuclei. Therefore, 3 and 4 go through the midbrain, 5, 6, 7, 8 through the pons and 9, 10, 11, 12 in the medulla. So, uh, we have to know about 5, 6, 7, 8 for, for our topic. So, acoustic neuroma occurs in the pons, right, cerebellopontine angle. Therefore, 5, 6, 7, 8 cranial nerves will be affected, especially the 5, 7 and 8. That is the trigeminal, facial and the vestibulocochlear nerve. Therefore, the patient will have hearing loss because his 8th cranial nerve is affected. Tinnitus, again, his, because this is his ear. Facial weakness because his facial nerve compression. Facial weakness is motor symptoms. Therefore, his 7th cranial nerve is affected. Like we have discussed before, 5th cranial nerve is the facial sensation. And the 7th, uh, that is the facial nerve, is the motor facial part. Right? Therefore, facial weakness, 7th cranial nerve. 
and the patient will have facial pain uh, and the patient will have facial pain or numbness that is the trigeminal nerve that is the sensations the patient might have ataxia also because this is the cerebellum that we are talking about and uh, sometimes in neurofibromatosis too which is a neurocutaneous syndrome uh, the patient might have bilateral acoustic neuroma so it is in the name itself type 2 therefore it is bilateral okay bi is nothing but 2 so for the investigations the main thing is MRI so as you can see here whenever a patient comes with any of these symptoms not all particularly at least a few like one or two or three or anything you will have to uh, ask the patient to undergo an MRI all right and MRI will show that uh, show the location of the tumor if present and audiometry to confirm that the patient is going to have SNHL again because his 8th cranial nerve is being affected here. Therefore, sensory neural that is his nerve is being damaged is damaged here. Therefore, SNHL. So, management for this condition is microsurgery all right, and radiation if necessary. You wait and watch if the patient if the tumor is too small if, or if the patient is asymptomatic. So, as a quick revision. Uh, BPPV has a V right so this V means vertigo so vertigo is the only symptom is the only main symptom that the patient is gonna have he's not gonna have a URTI or a hearing loss of tinnitus because his inner ear is not being affected so when the inner ear is affected then the patient will have hearing loss and tinnitus all right so vestibular neuritis and labyrinthitis have itis that is inflammation so this inflammation is always gonna be followed is always gonna follow a inf infection right so whenever there is a urti or any kind of infection the patient is gonna present with itis that, that is inf inflammation so the patient will have vertigo because we are talking about vertigo and since labyrinthitis labyrinth means the inner ear which is getting inflamed the patient will also have hearing loss plus or minus tinnitus Meniere's disease, just know the triad. The triad of Meniere's disease is vertigo plus sensory neural hearing loss and tinnitus. Alright, so this is all about vertigo.